now. All right. Uh, so two or three things before we start, two things actually. Um, one is we are uh, a part of the Linux Foundation. So we need we need to be aware that uh, we are bound by the uh, antitrust policy of Linux Foundation. Basically, it means that we are not going to indulge in any anti-competitive uh, behavior. That's the first thing. Second is our code of conduct, uh, which you can find in the uh, you know in detail in in if you search for it under the wiki page. Um, but primarily it says that we have to be, even when we disagree with someone, we have to be, uh, you know, we, we shouldn't be disagreeable. Uh, that's the first thing. Second is um, we give uh, people an opportunity to speak and we try to be as inclusive as possible in terms of the uh, differing, uh, you know, the diversity of opinions, the diversity of people, the diversity of expression. These are the only two requirements to participate in this call. Other than that, it's open to everyone and we will be making available the recording of the call on the uh, site that I just put in the uh, put in the chat before and please add your name to that list there are uh, 11 participants right now so without waiting any longer i'm going to ask uh, stephen phillips to talk about what he came to talk about which is the possibility of digital payment systems, especially ones that are backed by fiat equivalents, which may be un, uh, unpopular these days because of the rise of the Bitcoin and other cryptocurrencies, but it still is a viable option. So. Please listen to Stephen Phillips. He is the VP of bit.com. They are uh, currently undertaking a digital currency exercise, DXCD, in uh, Eastern uh, ECCB, uh, you know, which is the Eastern Caribbean Central Bank. They have signed a memorandum uh, with ECCB and a project is full underway. And that was in uh, February 2020. So obviously, uh, we are almost ready to hit the ground with that project. Uh, so Stephen, please uh, tell us more about this wonderful, about this uh, game changer in the Eastern Caribbean. Amazing. Thank you for the introduction, Vipin. Um, I hope I'm calling your name correct. Is that correct, Vipin? Yes, it's uh, as it is spelt. The VIP is in. So uh -huh, you, perfect. <laughs> you are uh, converted to Sikhism. I like how you did no. that, Vipin. <laughs> <laughs> are, are you, uh, have you converted to Sikhism? No, I am a Moor. Oh, wonderful. Yes. Yes. yes, yes. Fantastic. So are you seeing my share screen as well? Yes, we do. All right, amazing. Um, so without further ado, I'm happy to move into this if you guys are ready. Please. All right, fantastic. So um, I want to begin, uh, first of all, by saying a big thank you to the Linux Foundation and the team here within Hyperledger um, for inviting me to briefly share my thoughts and experiences with digital currencies. I'm truly grateful for all of you who've taken your time to join this call and to listen in. 
I, I hope we can have a very fun and um, interesting discussion today. So just a bit on me, I started my journey with digital currencies in 2016. And this was very tough. It was very early on. And at that time, very few central banks or financial institutions knew much about blockchain or distributed ledger technology. So it was, it's been a long road. Um, and today I lead product development at bit.com. So a brief introduction to bit.com. We are a financial technology company, the creator of the leading digital currency management system. And we enable central banks, financial institutions, regulators, payment providers to adopt digital currency infrastructure required for, next, for the next evolution of the financial ecosystem. So BIT is very much on the um, technology services uh, provider side of things. Um, our clients are central banks and financial institutions, and we provide them with technology to deploy these new modern payment system infrastructures and to achieve their strategic objectives. All right, so we begin our conversation on new opportunities for digital money with a look at adoption. Adoption for me is a key success metric for any transformative technology. And looking at the USDC stablecoin, we can recognize signs of growing adoption by a significant growth in USDC market capitalization representing a 900% increase in, in less than the last year with yesterday's daily trading volume exceeding 1.5 billion USD. Now this trend, um, in my opinion, is set to continue on the heels of the recent Office of the Com Comptroller of Currency, OCC, announcement clarifying national banks, federal savings associations can participate in independent node verification networks. So that's kind of a, uh, a weird way of saying blockchain and, and DLT. And use stable coins to conduct payment activities and other bank permissible functions. So for those of you who haven't heard of the OCC, uh, they are an, an independent bureau of the US Department of Treasury and they supervise nearly 1200 national banks, federal savings associations, and federal branches of foreign banks that conduct approximately 70% of all the banking business in the US. So this is a big regulator coming and smoothing the path for digital currency adoption with key um, stakeholders within the monetary system, you know, those tier one banks. Um, so moving away now from stable coins and looking more at looking more for success stories for adoption with CBDCs. We have central bank and regulator for the kingdom of Cambodia. I think they were the, uh, this project was the last um, um, talk that this, this group had um, early, early this year or late last year. Um, someone can correct me in the chat. Um, but their CBDC launched in 2019 and currently they have 50,000 users, $20 million worth of assets in their ecosystem and it's growing. So this is all against the backdrop of an increasingly large number of central banks globally conducting research into CBDC. So we, we can see that the trend is there and we have, and, and we, and we have the early signs that you know, things are taking root and um, this is gonna drive uh, uh, enhancements in the global payments infrastructures. Let's see, chat, all right. Okay, yes, first talk of 2021. <laughs> all right, um, so next slide, we now move into taking a closer look at BITS technology. Uh, so on screen, you have our, our system architecture at a high level. And we've architected a modular containerized software and payments infrastructure that is blockchain agnostic. Um, this allows for easy upgrades and can even support changing DLTs uh, based on client requirements. For instance, if there's a new blockchain that um, a client is particularly interested in that solves problems better or has particular features that they would want, 
our infrastructure facilitates um, migrating over to, to um, different um, blockchain or underlying ledger infrastructures. Um, privacy and is, is, a, is a very much a key talking point when we're talking about CBDCs and our infrastructure preserves the privacy of transacting parties by storing personally identifiable information off chain. So this makes transactions private, but not anonymous under investigation by regulators. And this is a very key design decision to keep that information off the chain and to allow regulators to access that information on, on an on a as needed basis. Um, next, we can talk briefly about minting. So we offer a secure offline minting system for asset creation and also destruction. Uh, a key component is also the public APIs you see over on the right. So these allow for ecosystem partner access and also really those are there to, to kind of drive financial innovation and adoption of the, of the CBDC central bank digital currency or synthetic central bank digital currency issued by a, a licensed entity. Uh, of importance, we also have, you see their wallet app and merchant app. We have custodial and non-custodial wallet, wallet types. And um, our, our infrastructure also supports other payment types such as payment cards. ISO 20022 standard messaging format facilitates interaction with the existing financial and global payments infrastructure. So that's a key piece for interoperability. ISO 20022 is continuing to be adopted globally. And we felt that that, is, that that was a key component to have for a messaging format to ensure we have interoperability with core banking systems and global payment system infrastructures. Looking at Eastern Caribbean Central Bank digital currency pilot more closely, on screen, we kind of have a, a large laundry list of motivations for central banks and emerging market economies to explore central bank digital currencies. To provide a brief overview of the Eastern Caribbean Central Bank, um, the ECCB is a monetary authority and sole issuer of currency within the Eastern Caribbean Currency Union. So this uh, currency union is made up of eight sovereign territories and is one of the oldest currency union global, globally. The, the EC digital currency, which is called DXCD, and it's the digital version of XCD, which is the, the ISO uh, currency code for the Eastern Caribbean currency. So DXCD is a term I may, I may say, I just mean the digital EC dollar. So this is configured as a two-tier with a, with a two-tier currency distribution model, and it's a retail CBDC. So licensed financial institutions play a critical role in the distribution of the digital EC dollar. Um, so they are, they are the only players that the central bank in this, uh, under these regulations can issue currency to. So they play a very key role in ensuring currency makes it to the retail market and consumers can have access to this digital currency. So a bit more on the pilot. It will commence initially with four territories um, within the Eastern Caribbean Currency Union and uh, will grow to include all territories within say six months. More specifically, the Eastern Caribbean Central Bank their motivations for embark embarking on this journey are really around promoting the inclusion of vulnerable populations. So this technology is gonna enhance accessibility and ease of doing digital payments. Uh, motivation number two is payments efficiencies and regulator compliance and regulatory compliance. So reducing the cost of payments is, is huge um, and, and reducing the cost of compliance for, for say financial institutions is, is also a key motivation. To give a, to give a, a quick story, um, you could be in one, you could bank with, with, with one bank, um, say you have a friend or a family member and they're in another country within the Eastern Caribbean Currency Union and you wanna send them say $100, it costs you today almost $100 to make that wire transfer and it takes about three to five days. So there are huge motivations for the central bank to kind of 
enhance efficiencies for payments and reduce costs um, within the economy. The final key motivation I would suggest is economic growth. Um, the governor of the, of the ECCB is very keen to facilitate and support digital transformation of the region. And um, this technology, central bank issued digital currencies can help facilitate that in a currency union by more closely connecting the economies of those eight territories within the Eastern Caribbean currency union. So you could imagine right now today, you know, business owners in one territory are kind of limited to their geographical area. However, with this technology, business owners can target all of the, all of the participants within the Eastern Caribbean Currency Union as a potential market because they can be paid and they can um, provide goods and services and get paid instantly via the central bank digital currency issued by the ECCB. So moving on, we are looking now at uh, the payments landscape, kind of past, present, and future. Um, one of the key motivations for the Eastern Caribbean Central Bank is to reduce cash in circulation, move from analog forms of, of payment to, to digital payments. So that will look like a reduction in, of cash in circulation, a reduction of check payments, and these will really drive the growth of the DXCD, the digital EC dollar, as well as electronic payments. So moving the economies into the digital age, reducing cash, reducing cash payments, which are very frictional and slow and costly uh, to uh, you know, faster payments instrument like a central bank digital, uh, digital currency or stable coin and uh, more electronic payments. So the, the, the vision here is this can help um, ease uh, doing business and uh, making payments simpler and easier for the uh, economies of, of the Eastern Caribbean Currency Union. So next up, we have the likely future for CBDCs. And this is my last slide, I'm very sure. Um, central banks are generally not very well equipped to operate and maintain real-time payments and settlement infrastructure. So looking at um, the first point, predominantly centralized operational and governance frameworks, um, where the future state is gonna be enhanced consortia and decentralized operational and governance frameworks. It's my assertion that in the near future, say two to five years, if not sooner, we will have digital currencies issued with enhanced, uh, decentralized and distributed governance and operational frameworks. This will provide key financial market stakeholders with a growing role for operating and shaping the payments infrastructure of the future. This is particularly exciting um, for the future of DLTs like Hyperledger Fabric, which um, the DXCD um, the digital EC dollar is based on because um, Hyperledger Fabric, as I'm sure you all know, um, it, it facilitates um, network nodes that have different permissions and rules. So it, it provides an easy way for different stakeholders to join the network and to play a meaningful role um, in, in, in adding resilience and um, buy-in to the, to the actual network itself. Moving on to the second point, um, where the current state is really single currency networks. And my, my idea for the future state of CBDCs is multi-currency or re really multi-asset networks. Um, we see that early exploratory work is being done by the Bank of France and a few other central banks who are looking into CBDC use cases, central bank digital currency use cases, such as delivery versus payment for securities and, and other opportunities over existing um, incumbent uh, payments infrastructures. So leveraging this new central bank digital currency infrastructure, it's likely that we will see central banks and monetary authorities issuing different types of collateralized assets like Vipin was saying earlier uh, for different use cases. This is particularly important because it potentially um, unlocks offline payment solutions, which is um, very huge and lots of talk around um, solving for offline payments. And I think that central banks can issue 
different types of assets that can be used in different ways. Um, for me, an offline payment solution would be more of a bearer instrument where the central bank would issue individual cents or the, the lowest denomination of the currency that they want to issue. That way, if um, it's offline, it's just a matter of transferring private keys and there's no need to settle on chain. Looking at the last point, we have um, a digital cash model, which is the current state and a future state for true programmable money. There's a lot of hype around programmable money right now as well, but the current state is really a digital cash model. CBDC, CBDC central bank digital currencies today remain a very nascent technology with little functionality in, in most documented deployments beyond offering a digital version of physical cash. And this is pretty much the same for stable coins as well. Future CBDCs are likely to leverage the programmable attributes of digital currencies more heavily, enhancing central bankers' monetary policy toolkits, which is very important. Um, you know, central banks are, many of them are approaching the lower zero bound, and they are really running out of tools to help stimulate the economy. So I'll leave you guys with a gem. Um, next generation digital currencies are likely to provide frameworks for dynamic interest rates, which we've heard a lot of talk about, but there's also kind of time stamped money that um, is an efficient method of reducing hoarding of, of, of currency because the money actually loses value if it, if it doesn't get transacted, so a form of demurrage. Um, so this is particularly exciting and, in, uh, and, and interesting, especially when we think about uh, economies wanting to move out of, of, of depression. So these types of tools can really equip central banks with uh, a lot more than they have accessible today. And it's my assertion that um, we will see more programmable money solutions um, evolving in the next, say, two to five years, if not sooner. So in summary, I just want to wrap things up. Um, we had a brief background on BIT and what BIT does. We looked at the evidence of global adoption of CBDCs and stable coins. We saw that amazing curve with 900% uh, growth in, in USDC as one example of a stable coin. Um, uh, we also looked at BIT's digital currency technology and um, infrastructure. Um, we looked at motivations for the ECCB to pilot a central bank digital currency. And we took a brief look at the future outlook for central bank digital currencies and stable coins and how these technologies will need to evolve to meet the future needs of um, payment systems and also you know, general stakeholders within the monetary system. So with that, I'm gonna conclude and open the floor for questions, hand back to you, Vipin, um, and you can take it away. Yes, uh, please uh, ask your burning questions <laughs> to Stephen and he'll put out the fire. <laughs> Hi Stephen, this is Karen. Thanks so much for coming on. Thank you for having me again. Um, I was wondering, you know, um, if you could provide a little bit more detail and information on um, how you're using Hyperledger Fabric, um, you know, what were some, uh, maybe some challenges and how you overcame them and, and using it for this um, uh, DXCD. Um, it's something that I think a lot of people are wondering and thinking about. Um, in terms of how to apply which DLT to these sorts of use cases. So if you can share anything more about that, that would be great. Sure. Um, so how are we using it? So um, in, in this use case, this client uh, wanted to use um, Hyperledger Fabric. Uh, they felt like it was a good fit. Um, so we went along with it. I, I think that it's a, it's a reasonable fit as well. Um, so the Hyperledger fabric sits here in what we call the NUMA. So this basically abstracts direct interactions with the, with the distributed ledger or the ledger technology um, to allow for, you know, all of, all of those particular attributes that, that make BITS technology great. So 
this framework allows for easy upgrades, swapping out the ledger. Um, you know, it, it creates a buffer that allows us to do lots of things operationally. So we're using um, version 1.2, I think, at the moment. Um, and I know, you know, from interactions with the technical team that, you know, there were some issues with uh, container containerizing certain components and getting things to work in the way that we want it to work for our clients. You know, some clients want infrastructure deployed on premises, some don't mind cloud deployment. So it's very important for us to be able to uh, provide the software in a manner that the client would actually accept. Um, so that was one of the key, key challenges that jumped out to me early on. Um, we, we did have to write, you know, all of the chain code for the digital currency itself. And because um, there was nothing native in, in Fabric at the time. So that was also, you know, a big ask and to, you know, to ensure that everything works perfectly right with that. Um, and also some other security layers, different types of wallets and what they can do and how they can move money and, you know, built in security via the um, chain code that, that we wrote and smart contracts. Was that helpful, Karen? Yeah, definitely. Okay, cool. Well, I'm open for any other questions. Don't be shy. Vipin, maybe you have one or two. Well, I could keep you here for a couple of hours. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, but, five minutes would be good. <laughs> I know, I know. Uh, you know, the reason I don't ask right away is because I want to give people the opportunity to ask what they have to ask. Yeah. And, uh, yeah. um, and that's why I'm keeping sort of in the background for now. So is, okay, does anybody, okay. uh, anybody else have questions? Yeah, um, Stephen, this is Sam uh, Manny uh, from SwapSub. Uh, can you give a bit more detail about how do you plug and play ledgers? What's your thought process? Let's say you, if you wanted to, re if some other central bank wanted to replace with an Ethereum based ledger, and what's your, how do you build, go about building it? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so that's, that's an important point. So. Um, like I said, we've been kind of working on this technology uh, for a number of years. So we recognized very early on that committing to one ledger technology may not be the best strategic play for the company because, uh, you know, there's new technologies coming out. So we need a way to be, um, uh, we need a way to future proof our infrastructure, so to speak. Um, the, the, we, we do very little with, with the ledger technology. It's kind of just a, a store of values, um, what it was intended to do, you know, maintain accurate records and maintain an immutable, you know, ledger. That's fine. But a lot of the value that the technology brings is, is on the layers above, you know, all of the business logic and, you know, custody stuff and applications and processes, uh, data models and process models built into to actual workflows. Um, you know, the ledger for us really just stores the values. So as long as a, as a blockchain or distributed ledger technology can su support smart contracts, um, it offers settlement finality via the consensus um, algorithm, you know, some, some pretty standard um, requirements that we would have when selecting a, a distributed ledger technology to um, be the backbone, you know, truth for, for, for balances, et, et cetera, within the entire uh, system architecture. Does that help any? Yeah, thank you. Okay, fantastic. Thank you for the question. Appreciate it. Um, any if there any anything else, I'm happy. Anyone hey, else? Steven. Yeah, this is Dave Hockhauser. Hi, Stephen. Nice, nice Hi. presentation. Um, Thank you. I to, um, and maybe discuss it, I missed it, but so to so what extent does some of the 
uses of it, have you started testing out some use, meaning like have used it for testing out a merchant, somebody purchasing something with it or transferring? Um, have you started testing out some sample applications with it? Yeah, for sure. So as part of, so BIT is providing all of the applications and technology for the execution of this pilot. So that means providing technology and applications for the central bank, financial institutions, uh, merchants, and then you know, retail consumer wallet apps as well. So we provide all of the technology um, and we, we have gone through some extensive testing. Um, we are just about ready to, to launch a, a beta uh, program uh, this week. So busy time for me. Um, but yes, we've done extensive testing. So, you know, merchants, they download an app from the app store. They sign up um, with their financial institution and they can immediately start receiving payments at the point of sale via, you know, QR code payments, NFC payments, um, uh, immediately at the point of sale. And it's very simple and very easy. It's kind of what you would expect for, you know, we're not we're not really innovating on 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 that transfer side. Right. You know, we're just scanning QR codes and NFC. You know, to get to in, to authorize the transactions kind of thing. So um, we are also uh, working on e-commerce an e-commerce solution um, in in the ECCBs in Eastern Caribbean Central Bank and Eastern Caribbean Currency Union. Access to online payments is you know pretty difficult. You have to spend like upwards of $10,000 to get a merchant account with one of these um, settlement banks. So it's quite difficult and that has um, kind of hindered the economy a lot. So with mm -hmm. the digital version of the EC dollar, you're going to have uh, e-commerce plugins available that you can add to your cart. These will work very similar to PayPal. Um, where you just add a few lines of code and you can have a pay with DXCD button, um, the digital EC dollar, and a QR code will come up on the screen and you as a user can scan that and pay or log in. So we are very excited to see how, especially with the global COVID-19 pandemic and the need to make more payments remotely, this is kind of very timely. Um, to have these types of solutions in place that can allow money to move even though people are not physically moving. And as you've seen in some of these slides, in uh, um, this slide, uh, currently, I mean, 2019 is a little outdated, but cash is, you know, there, there's, there's a huge amount of, of analog payments in this economy at the moment. And if you could imagine, if you have that much, analog payments happening and then there's a there's restrictions on movement of people or shops being open you can see how it could have uh, huge implications for the economy so migrating more payments to digital payments allows it still facilitates um, uh, electronic payments digital payments even though we may be all locked in our houses uh, we can still buy our food and have it delivered. You can still pay our bills and do all these things um, without leaving home. So there is a kind of a burning platform within the Eastern Caribbean to, to deploy more accessible, um, safe assets for, for consumers to adopt and, and to make their, their payments. So, uh, and so just as a follow-up, so is the organization starting to promote it to like the uh, merchants and people to start using it more or like how do they plan sure, on getting sure. people to start increasing? So we, um, the, the strategy has been very consultative. You know, we've, we've, we, to give, to give you some insight, you know, we would uh, work with key influential merchants in a territory. We would onboard them. So we've conducted training with them, you know, all the sensitization they would need um, to onboard, um, we've done all of that. So it's, it's very much a, a relationship building exercise. Um, uh, you have to remember these emerging market economies are not necessarily as familiar with digital payments and QR code payments as say a, a more developed economy like Brazil or the US or Mexico that, that are more kind of familiar with 
these types of payment methods. So there was a lot of education, a lot of handholding um, to, to kind of build the comfort and the trust. There's a lot of trust coming with the, with the digital EC dollar because it comes from the central bank. But you know anything new, there, there is still a little bit of friction there. You need to hold people's hand and to build that trust with actually making the payment and that comfort. So we spend a lot of time and put a lot of effort into understanding who those key merchants are and to make sure they have a very good experience with uh, the digital EC dollar because um, you know, the retail market is really gonna decide the success of this pilot project and the success of this uh, uh, CBDC. Um, you know, we really need to ensure that people are comfortable to use the product and we take that, we take any feedback um, that we get and we make the necessary adjustments quickly to kind of maintain the trust and, and the interest in this, in this uh, CBDC. I hope that was helpful, David. Yeah, very. Okay, good. Anyone else? Does that mean that I can uh, I can go ahead? Please do. I'm waiting on you. Okay. Uh, can you go back to the, the slide with the architecture diagram? Sure. Yeah. Here you have um, the top layer. This is the commerce layer with the private and the public API, and everything is obviously off chain. Uh, yeah. And then you have the bottom layer, Numa. That mm -hmm. seems to uh, uh, Numa. I assume is a lion in Swahili. I don't know. I mean, maybe, <laughs> maybe it's something <laughs> so, else. So this, <laughs> so this, 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 this Numa is a kind of proprietary term we came up with because um, we needed a way to kind of communicate with clients about what that is. So we had to kind of create our own term for it without trying to reuse terms and confusing uh, people. <laughs> so that that's the purpose for that. Okay. Uh, but that was not my uh, question. As you see uh, here, the, uh, the whole thing is floating with no linkages to anything else, uh, meaning the NUMA layer does not seem, I mean, even though it has an API layer, uh, we don't see any connections between it and uh, any other parties. So that is a little disconcerting. Uh, to say the least. <laughs> it's like Numa is uh, just uh, at a distance uh, getting all this information somehow. <laughs> so, uh, so basically, you, basically you, the, commerce, the commerce system sits on top of the Numa and, um, okay. and the commerce system will interact with the, with the Numa via its API. So this is how we can we can swap out this NUMA, swap in a new NUMA that has a different DLT or an upgraded DLT in there. So this is how we are able to do that seamlessly. Uh, remember, some of some of the some of the information has been left off for proprietary uh, purposes. Yes, yes, yes. I can't show everything, but um, this is just really meant to give a high level idea that the the DLT is kind of encapsulated in an API that provides a lot of services that then adds additional um, value to the, to the overall architecture by being able to leverage an API and not talk directly to the kind of uh, DLT APIs themselves. Yeah, I mean, that is a very core uh, principle of system architecture to have yes. uh, loose uh, you know, loose connections between the various components. Uh, so yes. in that sense, uh, how did you come up with the, uh, you know, the functions and the signature, function signatures, let's say, of the API layer? What, what were the thought processes that went through in your mind? Did you uh, look at other, other payment systems? Did you look at other uh, you know, how did you come up with that API layer? Because uh, the reason I'm asking is because I am now, um, let's say the, you know, I see that you are put in your um, membership of the DCGI. Uh, yes. uh, and I am now leading the interoperability uh, uh, working group, working work stream mm -hmm. inside right. uh, DCGI. So I'm very interested in whatever public information you can give about the API layer because the API layer would 
be, you know, the kind of system that that would allow interoperability, not just with switching out ledgers, but suppose there were another system, let, let's say the Western Caribbean <laughs> uh, cent central bank, uh, right. and then the Eastern Caribbean commerce layer would be able to interact with the Western Caribbean, uh, uh, you know, NUMA layer, it, you know, mm -hmm. for lack of a better term, uh, through the common API, because it is uh, now you have built in sort of a forward uh, interoperability by uh, having this API layer. But I'm also say, suggesting that that API layer could um, could enhance interoperability, even to, you know without uh, going to a different uh, ledger, but with going to a different system. Totally yes, I totally, I totally see what you mean. And um, we do have some patents pending. So I need to be careful with what I'm saying. But there are some very um, amazing opportunities for cross network, um, or cross infrastructure interoperability, leveraging that API layer like you're saying. Um, I'm thinking things like atomic transactions between currencies and different things like that, that are very exciting that this API layer can offer in terms of, you know, it provides a little bit of business logic um, uh, before getting to the actual ledger. So there are a lot of opportunities there um, for enhanced use cases, especially around cross-border and cross-currency um, that we are actively investigating and seeking patents on at the moment. Um, but uh, so Vipin, I, I contribute on the architecture and use cases working group. Um, with the yes, we, we yes. contributed. If you remember, uh, money showed up and I I was there talking about Ethaler. Uh, I mean, okay. maybe uh, that was the use case we contributed. You contributed the ECCB uh, yes, yes. Uh, DXCD uh, use case, I suppose. Um, yes. um, the the, but just, uh, just to wrap that up, I can actually put you in contact with my CTO uh, to, to go through in more detail, you know, what that API layer in Enuma looks like and um, how we see that providing value to the uh, in, entire digital currency ecosystem, you know, what that layer, if everyone has that layer, what it could allow and what we use it for today and, and how we see value from it. Um, so I can set that up for you, no problem. Well, I mean, uh, to tell you the truth, uh, standards in that API layer will need to be open. Otherwise, it will not be uh, useful to connect different uh, ecosystems. It, it, it's good, you know, if anybody has a proprietary interest, it often gets uh, lost uh, uh, yes. as, as an alternative because, uh, you know, again, it is the gatekeepers of the uh, of the API layer who will be controlling who can use it and so on. So that's you know that's another topic. Uh, but let's back up a little. I mean, I I I, I welcome that. Is that Gabriel or somebody else who's the CTO? No, that's uh, that's somebody else. That's um, a gentleman called Jim. Jim yeah. Martin. Jim Martin. Okay. Uh, I'll I'll be in touch. We have a, a meeting coming up this um, Friday, uh, mm -hmm. where we will be discussing some of these uh, uh, items. Um, anyway, so backing do up you see do you see ISO twenty o twenty two as um, that messaging standard? Um, do you see opportunities there for that at the Numa API layer? Um, well. Well, my problem with the ISO 20 or 22 is that it is not a standard. It's a collection of various things that everybody has contributed. If you look at the actual, uh, the, you know, XML, um, mm -hmm. uh, uh, what do you call it, definition or the uh, or, or the sort of a data standard and the enumeration, you will see. Yeah, yeah. It, you will see that it is 
uh, you know, the XSDs and the, and the various other parts of the standard, you'll see that it's basically a, a, a grab bag of stuff. I mean, it, it's huge. First of all, it is, uh, uh, you know, it's a swift, it is uh, various other parties. I mean, uh, money can tell you more about uh, uh, what, what the, I wouldn't say what the challenges of using such a system are. So unless you mm -hmm. can, uh, uh, you can, uh, so that's one aspect. The other aspect is the lack of uh, cryptographic uh, um, surety or integrity, which they have tried to uh, allay by using, a, a, by creating a new header standard for uh, ISO 10, uh, 20 or 22, but it's it's optional, which means that no most people will not use it, use that mm -hmm. use that cryptographic integrity part, which is the most important part because all of those hacks that Swift was uh, subject to would not have happened if they had a proper, uh, you know, the Swift empty messages are what MT e e messages are the ones that, you know, many of them got transferred into the ISO 20 or 22 without much uh, uh, change. Mm -hmm. uh, our view is that that itself needs a, a very thorough review. Uh, the, mm -hmm. the problem is many central banks have swallowed this. They are not technical. They do mm -hmm. not understand the uh, problems with this and uh, Money, in fact, has proposed that uh, the CDM, which is is does uh, data standard, should be used because it's it's uh, it's got cryptographic integrity, and it also models lifecycle events, not just it's not just a one-time message passing system. There is another message, you know, there are other message passing systems like XCM, which is a Polkadot's messaging system. Other uh, messaging uh, paradigms come out of supply chains. And if you go to World Economic Forum, you can see a new uh, message standard being proposed there, uh, which, which involves uh, cryptographic uh, integrity and it's for trade finance and supply chain documents. And uh, it contains things like hashes of documents and various other things. So it's not just for uh, payment systems anyway. I don't, you know, that could be an entirely, uh, uh, you know, full hour or hour and a half of uh, work. We have started something in our uh, Hyperledger Labs under uh, Capital Markets. It's called XCCI, XCSI, sorry, Cross Chain Settlement Instruction, which is mm. uh, similar in uh, spirit uh, in the sense that it has cryptographic integrity and uh, references uh, inlaid into it. That means like, for example, if I say DXCD, how do I know that it is the Eastern Caribbean Central Bank digital currency? Uh, because the ISO standard currently 4217 only looks at regular uh, uh, currencies. Then how do, you know, how do we refer to the new class of cryptocurrencies. Various people have come up with that uh, standard and we are uh, incorporating those kind of thought processes into our uh, XCCI because you can have payments in various forms. It is a very uh, sort of just in the thought process formation stage of uh, you okay. know, XCCI. I was just going to ask if there's something publicly available that I could read. It, 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 is, it is publicly available. The, uh, you know, the pr proposal, it's in Hyperledger Labs. Uh, okay. okay. Uh, so not much detail is there. Uh, but uh, again, let's back up a little bit on this particular thing about privacy. Mm -hmm. I have a couple of questions. One is, um, sure. um, you say, that the PII is kept uh, locally, uh, I mean, uh, off-chain, yes. uh, in a database. Uh, mm -hmm. we, know, we know that this sort of uh, databases are very vulnerable. Uh, in fact, even the US government didn't seem to be able to uh, secure their uh, 
uh, internal databases. So uh, there, you know, it's the honeypot problem, right? I mean, you have yes, a honeypot. Yes. Everybody. Yes, but it's not centralized. It's not centralized. I didn't go into granular detail, but it's not a centralized database hosting all of the information. So it's uh, the information is distributed by financial institutions. So if if I bank with First National, First National's um, infrastructure, their node on in the commerce, their their assigned segregated database in the commerce engine is going to have my data if you see what i mean so every financial every participating network player they have you know siloed data that only they control okay beautiful it's better than everything in one place but maybe yeah. everything in five places <laughs> i mean because i'm sure that the uh, the scale uh, of organizations are huge meaning uh, uh, you know maybe 80% of the people bank with uh, four or five organizations rather. Than, I mean, in the US it's true, you know, like if you take JP Morgan, Citi, yes. uh, Wells Fargo and Bank of America, you probably cover like, you know, 85%. <laughs> so it's, still, it's still kind of a honey pot, isn't it? <laughs> yes, there, you know, the, the problem, it's a very difficult problem to solve and right. uh, people right. are working on it, so, you know, the whole I'm SSI. glad you recognize that because we we didn't, you know, you can use Chardin and, and channels and all of these different things, but it, um, we went with this model of um, we went with this model of having client information stored by the by the financial institution because it's what they already do, so it's not really a paradigm shift if you see what I mean. It's easy for them to digest it at this early stage, but looking forward, you know, if there's a clear, um, scalable, very fast solution that is built into the DLT ledger, then we have the infrastructure that could allow us to upgrade to that, if you see what I mean. Yes, I do. Uh, I mean, we are, uh, I also run the identity working group and we are, you know, we have the whole SSI crowd over there with, uh, you know, distributed key management systems, uh, verifiable credentials and self-sovereign identity and all that. And we are, you know, they are still figuring out the yeah. last mile problem and how to integrate with the legacy systems in such a way that it becomes useful and it is not hackable easily. I mean, right. usually that means moving stuff uh, uh, to the edges uh, more to the edges and how can you secure that data? How can you back it up? How can you re recover it? All of this becomes problem. Uh, uh, anyway, uh, going to the wallet app, you said that you had two different kinds of wallets. One was a yes. custodial wallet and a non-custodial wallet. So in yes. terms of the custodial uh, and non-custodial wallets, do you have limits on how much those wallets can hold? Uh, yes. Uh, yes. So the, 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 the non-custodial wallet is targeted towards financial inclusion. So this is really allowing um, citizens within the Eastern Caribbean Currency Union to onboard to digital currency without needing a relationship with a financial institution. So this basically provides a, 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 a early step for the central bank to make this legal tender. That way, you know, no one really has an excuse for not having it. If I show up at your shop and I want to pay you in DXED, you know, you're kind of bound to, to upset the payment. And I think that that's going to be a, a very, you know, reaching that critical mass to where that's happening in practice. Is going to be an important milestone for overall adoption of these types of uh, digital currencies. I mean, it's one thing for the central bank to proclaim it as um, legal tender, but um, you know, in practice, it needs to be accepted. Um, so, said all of that to get back to the point that yes, we have this. We have a custodial and a non-custodial wallet, um, and um, that's really around ensuring that we are not building in. Um, 
the same frictions that we have in the existing payment system infrastructure where, you know, uh, you, you know, a merchant online, they have an online portal for payments, but you need a SWIFT or you, you need a Visa or a, or a MasterCard to make the payment. So this kind of bridges the gap. Everyone within the ECCU can access the DXCD app and, you know, it follows that then, you know, anyone can make payments. Um, an important part there to talk about for the, um, the, the non-custodial wallet is, is that it leverages the merchant network to cash in and cash out of um, the digital EC dollar. So you can visit a merchant, you can hand over cash, and the merchant will send you the equivalent of digital dollars to your uh, non-custodial wallet. It's a little different with the custodial wallet because you're leveraging your financial institution to just make instant moves from your deposit account to your digital wallet. Um, but both wallets can visit merchants and cash in and cash out. The custodial wallet, um, financial institutions, due to regulations, you know, they can only really service their existing clients. So um, uh, a, a non-custodial wallet wouldn't be able to walk into a bank and, and get a service because they're not known to the bank. Um, so there are limits on all of the wallets, the custodial wallets, the limits are controlled by the individual financial institution where the um, wallet is kind of housed or created. Um, with the non-custodial wallet, the limits are much lower. Um, the ECCB has implemented um, an uh, uh, entity that they're calling or, or multiple entities per territory that they call agencies. And these agencies are responsible for verifying the identity of individuals who want to sign up for that non-custodial wallet. So while we know that technology exists for ID verification and it can all be done in the back end by a, you know, machine learning and, you know, looking for different um, known issues with IDs and lively mischeck on the selfie and matching that, et cetera. Um, they, they still opted to have an actual compliance team review the applications and approve them before allowing these value-based, these um, non-custodial wallet users to participate in the Dcash network. So there's, there's low limits. There's that ID verification that's automated by the software. And then there's a, a human that actually eyeballs the ID and the selfie image and verifies. Um, so lots of um, safety and security built into the infrastructure to provide the access, but to do it in a very responsible manner. Um, you know, these technologies are very new and there's a lot of eyes looking in on them. So I guess they wanted to go the extra mile to make sure that we, we um, the infrastructure, the, the framework for um, uh, good compliance controls was in place. Great. Um, uh, I, ha I have a quick question. Can yeah, I jump ahead. in here just before we finish? Um, I just wanted to hear a little more detail on your pilot. So um, mm -hmm. is this the first stage of your pilot that you say is starting or where are you at in your, in your pilot in the four territories and what um, activities are part of that pilot? Sure, so we are in the kind of closed beta stage where we are currently <laughs> from the 20th onboarding financial institutions to the infrastructure. So they take control of their, um, their infrastructure. They start to build out their branches, build out their wallets and their users and that stuff. So that's kind of where we are. Um, we, we move quickly to onboarding merchants and agencies and um, getting them transaction ready um, via teams on the ground, visiting them, holding their hands, making sure they understand how to use the tech technology and they're ready. Um, and then we move to onboarding, um, a, you know, a select group of consumers to, to start transacting. Um, mm -hmm. Beyond that, um, the ECCB will make a final decision um, after some monitoring and evaluation to see what adjustments need to be made before going public. And it's likely that we'll go public within two months. Um, we'll do this closed uh, beta period and uh, we'll do some monitoring and evaluation and have an assessment and then we'll move mm -hmm. into the public um, 
launch. Uh, and, it, and that's planned for sometime in March. So you can say by the end of first quarter, we should be, we should be public with this technology. Okay, hey, great. Thanks for, thanks for a okay. wonderful presentation. And I think we are uh, sort of, uh, we have reached the end of the hour, a delightful hour. Uh, and uh, thank you for showing up and presenting on this important topic. And uh, we want to make sure that uh, if you can share this uh, slide deck, that it would be available to our members. And I hope, uh, you know, I hope uh, we can revisit this topic when you go live in two months. Yeah, yeah, that would be great. It's <laughs> just the same. <laughs> All right. Sure. You know, thank you for having me, and I'm and I'm very happy to talk with with, with um, you guys again. No problem. Uh, it's you know it's important that we we keep those um, relationships and we share information and experiences. So I look forward to these types of conversations where I can learn and share my experience and my knowledge as well. So. Uh, mutually beneficial from from my side, so I'm happy to return and to meet with you guys again and to talk some more in the near future. Well, apologies for you know going on at length about uh, messaging systems, but I think it's no, that's important. That's fine. I learned. I learned something. <laughs> that's fine. <laughs> <laughs> so um, anyway, we we hope to have you back here uh, with the uh, uh, with uh, with a with your glowing smile back again um, and uh, I would love that and it is my uh, first opportunity to talk to a more and I'm very happy to have made your acquaintance uh, well, thank right. you same here same here thank you so much for having me and uh, continue to enjoy your days thank you thank you very much Stephen thank you thank you all right bye